Please uh, continue enjoying lunch, but uh, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dan Jones. But before I do, I want to remind you about evaluations. We have not handed them out yet, so you don't use them to do tic-tac-toe or shopping lists or, or more particularly notes about the presentations. But uh, they're very, very important for us. We really are eager for, to get your evaluations to be able to uh, tailor subsequent programs to what your particular interests are. Well, it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce my friend Dan Jones. Uh, Dan studied Chinese language and literature at Yale as an undergraduate. He got a doctorate in the history of the American West with a study of the land reformer and preservationist John Wesley Powell. And then he returned to Yale for a master's degree in uh, forestry. Uh, Dan is the CEO of uh, the Parklands at Floyd's Fork, a new uh, park which will eventually uh, total 4,000 acres, but already totals 3,700 acres, all of which has been assembled within the past about six, six years. About six years. So this is an extraordinary, extraordinary achievement, uh, and certainly something that uh, calls national attention. Louisville, the park uh, along Floyd's Fork snakes along 27 miles of the Floyd's Fork Creek, an extraordinary new nature and recreational uh, resource. Uh, so Dan's going to talk about the present and future of uh, the parklands at Floyd's Fork, uh, with maybe some speculation at the end or some speculation from the audience about how public art might intersect with this extraordinary new venture. Please welcome Dan Jones. Thanks, thanks, Peter. Does everybody hear me okay? The mic is um, projecting. Okay, so um, I am Dan Jones. I'm the chairman and CEO of 21st Century Parks, which is developing the Parklands of Floyd's Fork, which is about uh, currently about a 3,700 acre addition to Louisville's public park system. Um, you may well be asking what I know about public art. I'm trained as a historian. I went to forestry school and he didn't mention this but I worked about 15 years in the real estate business so I, I really sort of came uh, to park development from the side um, certainly I uh, grew up in the Olmstead parks I grew up in the Highlands in Louisville um, playing in Cherokee Park I spent a lot of time backpacking and so on but I really didn't have any formal training and so most of what you're going to get from me is kind of on the job stuff. Um, the, f the first half of this, I'm going to give a quick recap of the Parklands of Floyd's Fork, the project. Some of you will have seen a longer version uh, of this, so I apologize. Uh, you, you'll get it again. And then the second half, I did actually take a stab. Um, you know, I was trained as an academic, so um, I'm not afraid to take a stab at, at um, formulating a few opinions about um, public art. Um, and I think, and I, I one of the nice things about my job is I'm never quite sure what I'm going to do. This morning at 9 o'clock, at about 30 degrees, I was standing in Floyd's Fork collecting fish with two fish and wildlife biologists. Um, one of the things people don't know a lot, uh, Kentucky has the third most biodiverse streams of the 50 states. And in the springtime, uh, many of our fish, particularly the darters, are like songbirds. They bloom in these, the males bloom in these beautiful colors. And so we were collecting these rainbow darters, which is kind of like a painted bunting, if you know, of, of the stream. So anyway, and then this afternoon I get to talk about public art. Um, the park is titled, uh, or it's uh, titled The Park is Art, Art in the Park, Present and Future. Um, and uh, you know, for us, this is one of the taglines that I stick on my email. So um, it may seem a little shallow, but I just want to, to point out that we really do believe that the parks themselves are a major piece of public art. And I think that's probably the most misunderstood thing about our project. People get the recreational side, they get the environmental side. I'm not sure they really get the architectural side and the, and the amount of time and attention to detail that um, our architectural and planning team has put into that. So you'll, you'll hear me talk a little bit about that uh, as we go through. 
Um, I'd like to start with a few pictures just to show you what the landscape looks like. Uh, we follow about, uh, as Peter mentioned, about 25 plus miles of Floyd's Fork of the Salt River. Uh, very prototypical Kentucky stream, you know, it's, it's really beautiful. Um, but there's thousands of them in the state of Kentucky. What makes this one unique is that it's 20 minutes from downtown in Kentucky's largest urban area. I mean, think about that. This morning I was out collecting these fish, uh, you know, 20 minutes from where I stand, actually about 18 minutes from where I stand today. And there's an incredible connection um, to nature uh, and to natural history that can be built uh, through this stream. Uh, changes its moods in the seasons, um, and uh, and by the way, we have spent a lot of time learning the natural history. I hired uh, for four and a half years a naturalist um, out of the Antioch Graduate School of New England named Michael Gage, who's one of the finest young naturalists in the country, and we started him on a project we called the 100 Special Places Project, which was you know, just go walk the landscape and see what you find. We now have 400 sites, over 400 sites that are GPS, they're described, they're thematically organized, and we bundled them into a, a kind of story, a narrative. Uh, our planners used them when they laid out our trail systems, so we were quite intentional about how we uh, took that story. Um, and that was largely because I grew up in Kentucky thinking to get great natural history I had to go somewhere else. Um, you know, go to the Rocky Mountains, whatever. Um, that's just not true. We have amazing natural history uh, here. Uh, we have some of the best um, geologic outcrops in the world. We have, you know, we live in the heart of a uh, temperate deciduous forest, which, you know, if, uh, we talk a lot about the tropical rainforest because it's different and it's exotic, but if we lived in the tropics, you know, this would be different and exotic. It's an amazing uh, and very uh, distinctive place in terms of its natural history. Um, you know, great landscapes out there, uh, and, and most people in Louisville don't know that these landscapes exist. This is about an 80-foot waterfall, and there's a whole section in the south that we call the Waterfall District. Um, in addition to the natural history, there's a great cultural landscape out there as well. Um, and one of the things that our architects and planners have done is to um, both preserve that. We actually will have working farm fields within the project. Um, some of that may grow local food, but it's also uh, a piece of what, you know, a kid on a bike could see as they're riding through this. They could see a farmer on a tractor or they could see a, you know, a field of corn or, or soybeans or whatever it might be. So, um, and then we also adaptively reuse these buildings architecturally, which I'll show you in a minute. So that gives you a little sense of, of the landscape. Uh, for those who aren't from Louisville, if, if you sort of, you know, if Louisville was a blob, we cut north to south through the eastern third of Louisville Metro. And we go almost from the county line in the north to the county line in the south. So um, <clears throat> now I'll kind of jump into the uh, philosophically, you know, why, why did we want to do this project? Um, and there's a pretty simple, um, guiding principle there, which we didn't discover. I always think that Olmsted probably articulated it and practiced it the best, but that is that parks are not only, you know, for recreation and health and so on, they're also urban infrastructure. And like any other kind of infrastructure, they work best if you put them in first. And so, of course, you'll recognize um, Central Park, which begins at 59th Street in the south. When Olmsted laid out Central Park, um, Manhattan was 30 blocks to the south. Um, that was his first park, you know, he made his reputation on it, uh, and of course most people are familiar with that. What a lot of people aren't familiar with is that uh, Olmsted Sr. came to Louisville in the early 1890s and designed his last park system. And when he came to Louisville, uh, we were about the size of that little white blob in the middle, and he laid out the three main parks, Shawnee, Iroquois, and Cherokee, and a, a system of connecting Parkways, one of which uh, Southern Parkway and Eastern, or two of which Southern and Eastern Parkway, essentially combine at the U of L campus. Um, and when they were built, they were well beyond the edge of the city, and then the city grew around them. So essentially, he applied that uh, vision of urban infrastructure as city shaping uh, green infrastructure to our city. Olmsted designed systems for almost every major city in the country that, at that time, but only Louisville, Boston, Buffalo, and Rochester actually built it to completion. Um, to me, it is a major piece of public art. If it were a Michelangelo, we would have built a museum over it. Um, to have you know, a designer of his ability and stature not only design a series of special places, but shape the way in which our city grew around them, I think is a phenomenal 
phenomenal achievement. And you know, our big idea is simply do that again. Um, get the land while it's available and affordable. Create not a single park, but a systemic world-class addition to Louisville's public park system. Um, and out of that, we hope, create the finest urban edge in the country. Um, so uh, this next uh, uh, addition to the slide reflects that. What you see in green along the right of your, I think, is it on the right? Hopefully it's on the right. Um, of your, uh, what you see is us. And again, that is about um, 15 or 16 miles as the crow flies, about 19 miles as the bike path uh, winds through there. That's over 80 separate real estate transactions in about seven years to uh, not only assemble the acreage, uh, which was challenging, but to get it connected. Um, and some of them were, you know, for somebody who'd worked in the real estate business, um, the transactions were very oddball, um, but nevertheless, we were able, um, we are physically connected along the entire corridor now. Um, that's great for bike infrastructure. It's also great for reforestation along the stream, you know, the riparian corridor. We can create connected corridors for all kinds of things. Um, it is one of the largest new metropolitan parks projects in the country. Um, some of you may be familiar with some of these other names on here. Uh, we think that's great. Uh, what we think is most important is that, uh, as far as we know, we're the only one of those that's 100% funded. Um, we completed a $120 million capital campaign at the end of February um, to do this. Um, yeah. Was, <laughs> that's why I'm now able to go wade in the, the creek at 9 o'clock in the morning. So, um, so uh, we think this is very important for Louisville, but we also think that the 21st century is going to be an urban century. You know, the rest of the world is pouring into cities and they basically they have a choice. Uh, they can put the infrastructure in first uh, and in this case, you know, what I know about and care about is green infrastructure, particularly public parks and open space, but you can apply it to any form of infrastructure. They can put it in first and they can get it right or closer to right or they cannot put it in and in 50 years they're going to do what Atlanta is trying to do which is go back and retrofit a project called the Beltline which is about a third the size of our projects uh, over four times the cost and frankly may or may not get done. It's politically very very difficult and um, McKinsey which is the big consulting firm did a big report called China's Urban Billion uh, in like 2010 and they projected that in 15 years, China would add 350 million people to their urban population. And this report was all about the infrastructure they need to build. So in 15 years, they have to build an urban infrastructure for a population greater than the United States. Think about that as a challenge. Uh, they didn't mention parks once. Um, I'm not saying there aren't cities in China that are doing good park planning and so on. But you know the, the great lesson that I take out of the work that Olmsted and others, and he wasn't the only one who did it, um, is that uh, you can improve the ultimate livability of a city if you think ahead. Uh, you know that's pretty obvious to people in in this room, but it doesn't always happen in in reality. So so that's the context. Um, a little bit about um, what we are, and then. Um, just to kind of, and I'm going to go through this fa fairly quickly. I want you to just kind of get the impression of the park because, or the parks, because when I come back to my points about public art, I'll, I'll be kind of making reference to some of these things. Um, but the Parklands is systemic. It's actually four separate parks. I'm going to show you a map uh, in a minute. It is connected by various kinds of infrastructure. I mentioned the bike path. We have a park road that is about 20 miles long. About 14 of those miles we use existing kind of scenic byway. Um, roads and then we build connections into the new parks to tie that all together. We have a canoe trail, a paddling trail um, and of course we always follow Floyd's Fork, this very beautiful Kentucky stream. Um, these are the parks and uh, we named each park after uh, the major tributary. We wanted to show that idea of system in the naming of the parks. So Beckley Creek comes into the northernmost park. That's the creek I was standing in this morning. Um, I also, the only two otters I've ever seen, we actually have freshwater otters um, out there. Um, I saw in this little 10 foot wide creek, so there's a, a remarkable amount of, of life out there. Um, then we go to Popelik Park. We have a little piece of connecting infrastructure we call the Strand. That red line is the Louisville Loop, which is the planned 100 mile bike path around the city. That's our, we build 19 miles of that. And so that's what you see that, and that, this piece is all about getting the bike path through there. 
Um, then Turkey Run Park, that's over 1,100 acres. Um, you see this little um, kind of kidney bean shaped island. I'm going to show you a picture of that uh, in, a, in a couple minutes. Um, it's called Mary's Island after Mary Bingham, um, who was an early donor to one of our land partners that helped to purchase that property. But this, after the Jefferson Forest, Turkey Run Park will be the largest uh, public park in the city of Louisville at about 1,100 acres. Um, and then Broad Run Park, which brings us out uh, to the southern edge. So, um, you know, you have to get this idea of this sort of linear, sinuous thing, kind of an emerald necklace, if you will, that bulges out um, periodically to create these, these bigger parks. So, um, now I'm going to take a little bit deeper dive um, into the architecture and the planning. Uh, Beckley Creek, the northernmost park, very what I call people-centric, urban, formal. Um, and it centers on a very large um, uh, kind of green thing that we call the egg lawn, which is, for those who are from Louisville, I call it the Seneca Park of this project. Just a big, flat, flexible green space. You can, you know, uh, walk and run in the morning. You can set up a soccer practice at the end of the day or, you know, a, a pickup game. You can have a picnic, throw a frisbee. The Great Lawn in Central Park or the Sheep's Meadow or something uh, would be an equivalent there. But it's very much a people space. Um, and next to it sits a, uh, a kind of a Creekside, we call it the Creekside Center, which has some buildings I'm going to show you pictures of. And that's I-64 kind of running uh, through the bottom there to just to um, orient you has a walking path around it. Um, and this shows it under construction. It actually, this was taken about um, late last summer. Um, so it's, it's actually green. Now we call it the egg lawn just because when they drew it, it looked like an egg. Yeah, there wasn't any intent that it be shaped like an egg. It just fit the um, Wallace Robertson Todd, for some of you who know um, architecture are the uh, prime landscape architect on this project out of Philadelphia. And then the cluster of buildings you see down here is the Creekside Center. Uh, Beckley Creek, where I was standing this morning, was right here. And this is our education building. So, you know, one of our goals is uh, not really to keep people in the building. We think that the 3,700 acres is the classroom. Um, in that uh, center, right on the creek, we have a very large uh, uh, community center building called the Geens Foundation Lodge. Uh, one side has a room that seats about 80 people. This, this group would fit pretty comfortably. The other side seats about 300 people. So we can host weddings, outings, community events. Um, this is also someone that I, I came in at the end of the, the last speaker in the panel. People were talking about funding. Um, uh, in our funding model for this, um, this is one of our major sources of earned income to underwrite the maintenance and operations of the park. And this just shows it under construction. It's, what's interesting about this from a design standpoint is that it's one of the few places along the entire length of the project that we're right next to the creek, but we're out of the 100-year floodplain. And so one of our goals is to always bring people to the creek. Uh, that is the central geographic feature of the project. And, you know, typically they're getting dirty. They're in a canoe, they're hunting for crawdads. This is a place where, you know, a meeting like this, people are dressed up or, you know, or whatever. So it, uh, it's another way in which we can, it's another amenity within the park. Um, this is our uh, education building. The front half, the glassy side, is a walk-in kind of welcome center, National Park Service Visitor Center. We took a lot of that interpretive information from our naturalists and worked with a uh, a kind of National Park Service consultant. So we have um, a lot of information in there about natural history and cultural history. And, and then the back side is two state-of-the-art classrooms. So this is where, that would be where more formal education would take, take place. And this just shows it um, uh, completed. Uh, this is one of the new bridges we built uh, as part of the park road. And this shows it from above. And this shows it um, uh, from underneath and on the far side of the stream, you see these big stone blocks. Those are, uh, the step down there is about four, about four feet high and those were designed, typically the space under a bridge is dead space. Um, and what we wanted to do, we had to get the bridges up high because of the, the hydrologic re uh, regime of Floyd's Fork. Uh, so that's an access point. That's a place where a fisherman can stand. When I go there with my kids, we get up under the bridge and in the shadow of the bridge you can really see the fish in the creek. And So it becomes a place that people can actually access the stream. 
Um, we did put in a, a playground and spray ground that was uh, Leo Magazine named the, the number one playground in the city last year, which we were very proud of. Um, so Beckley Creek Park, very people-centric, you know, very kind of formal and so on. Turkey Run Park, which is that 1,100 acre park, completely different design intent, recreational intent. Um, you'll see in a minute the architecture is much more rural. The, the recreation is what we call adventure programming. So this is hiking, mountain biking. Uh, if we ever built a climbing wall or a zip line or something, this would be uh, where it would be. Um, and it's also, we call it the quiet park. You know, this is the place where you go to, to get away from, from things. So it centers on an old uh, a dairy farm. We bought it from the seventh generation owners of the owners. Uh, this building here, can you all see my, is the cursor appearing up there? When I, okay, all right, I'm good. <laughs> I've been doing that a number of times. Um, this is the only new building. All the other buildings were existing farm buildings. These are not National Register type buildings. They're just very uh, typical Kentucky rural architecture. Uh, and it sits at a high point on the land. So um, we're going to recap the silo and put a stairway in it. So you're, if you're riding your bike through there, you can hop off your bike, climb up to the top. Um, the lawn is an event lawn. We could host a bluegrass concert series or a farmer's market. Um, this tobacco barn becomes a picnic pavilion. So like the Gein's Lodge, you could come out and have an event, but this is a blue jeans and t-shirt event. And then this is really the gateway into the, that 1,100 acres of, of what is some for us today, and as I'm going to show you in a few minutes, uh, we plan to um, create a very large forest around that. Um, this just shows an artist's rendering of a farmer's market taking place there. Um, we are building a, um, a suspension bridge up in the treetops. This is one of these, you know, we want to get people out of their cars. We want to get them outdoors. Um, we think that, you know, the most ardent couch potato will come down here. But we could also take a school group out and, you know, from 10 feet away, see the warbler migration in the spring. Um, quick aside, the best um, observation I ever had of a warbler in the state of Kentucky was from the third floor of the Ekstrom Library. Um, I don't know if they're still there, but there used to be these huge tulip poplars and you could stand up there and I was up there doing something and I suddenly realized that there were these birds out in the tree. I sat up there for about 30 minutes, so I see John shaking his head. Sounds like they may be, they may be gone. Um, okay. I think this audience, you know, lots of benefits, right? It's community benefits, it's public space, recreation, environment, it's quality of life, um, health. We just got a grant from Norton Healthcare to begin to investigate, um, you know, sort of how we can actually use these amenities creatively to promote better health. And then last but not least is education. And we got a grant from the GE Foundation. Our focus is scientific literacy. Uh, through an experiential interdisciplinary approach. So if there are any English teachers, art teachers in the crowd, uh, we want you to bring your students out here too. Uh, they'll be learning natural history, but if you're an English teacher, maybe they write an essay. Or if you're an artist, they, they sketch something. Um, if you're a scientist, then you know, maybe they do an experiment or collect some data or whatever. All right, so that's the project in a nutshell. Now I'm going to uh, vent, which I know very well and I feel very comfortable with. Now I'm going to venture into uh, some terrain that I've not been before. This is the first time I've ever given this talk, and so we'll see how it goes. But I like to think of things in terms of scale. Um, and I think a lot of times when people think about public art, they're actually thinking at only one level of scale, which is kind of the streetscape scale sort of, you know, um, I did notice the video artist from Bellarmine who spoke before, she was getting into some bigger scale with her projections. She's There she is, yeah. Um, so. I would argue that you can take that, um, uh, you know, to a landscape level. And I'm not going to spend any time on this, but I think the city itself really is art. And that the way in which cities are laid out um, uh, can be looked at as an artistic landscape. And um, I don't think we do this very well anymore. Um, and there probably will be people who will disagree with the examples I'm about to give you. But, um, you know, Daniel Burnham's plan for Chicago I would argue is a form of public art, um, and um, you know, and of course he, you know, thought about it. And Chicago, I think, did a pretty good job of executing it. You know, Houseman's plan for Paris, um, 
uh, was a form of public art. And so, uh, again, I'm not going to dwell on this scale. The only reason I say it, uh, you know, I even uh, thought about putting it in, is that when you think about the scale of our project and this, you know, this thing that you could look at Louisville from above or in a Google image, or uh, you will see it. Um, and so I think you can see the Olmsted Park system if you look uh, down from above. And so I think they really do create this broader uh, landscape. But um, enough said about that. Again, this was that point about if you look down on our, our project. Um, I think the system itself um, uh, has some artistic imprint. Um, so again, it is linear, it's sinuous. Um, a, a lot of that is a function of the, the real estate acquisition we had to do. I won't uh, lie, you know, it would have been lovely if we could have, you know, created exactly the form that we wanted. But we did have some places where we had choices. Um, and so um, we certainly were trying to create mass in certain areas so that, you know, that sort of emerald necklace form. But I think there's a, a you know, some, uh, some form in that as well. Um, so now I want to dive in a little bit deeper into the park itself as art. Um, and I want to start with the natural landscape. And I think part of, of what a, a good park planner, a good landscape architect does, uh, particularly at this scale, but I think it works at any scale, um, is they create views. Um, they take a, a landscape that is already there and they make it visible, they make it available, they may bring some drama to it, they may you know, have the bike path come around a curve in just the right place so that view opens up. Um, but that was one of the things that we challenged our architects to do. So this is Mary's Island, that sort of kidney-shaped island that I showed you. It's at, the, at one edge of, of Turkey Run Park. And you can see how beautiful this landscape is, right? And there's all kinds of things going on in that landscape. You know, there's natural history, there's cultural history, farming history. Um, and the, the preservation of that within the park and the integration of it into what park users you use and see and experience, to me, is a piece of public art. This is a slightly different example. This is a Photoshop image of Turkey Run Park. Um, that, again, the 1,100 acre park. Uh, Mary's Island would actually be, uh, you can see it off to the left here. That's Mary's Island. Um, but what this shows is, again, a kind of landscape level shaping of, of, of the park plan. And so uh, some of these open areas are open today, um, uh, but most of what you see as forested is not forested today. And so our environmental plan is, we call it the 100 year vision, and if you think about it, you know, you have to, um, if you're going to plant trees that you want to be a forest, you've got to plant them today. And, um, the, so a lot of this is very intentional shaping of the landscape. You know, we made a conscious decision that certain places would be open, certain places would be forested. Um, this is another example. This is up in Beckley Creek uh, Park right off of Shelbyville Road. Uh, you can see the park drive coming in here. Um, uh, this actually was an old road that dead ended into the uh, MSD plant, which is actually now sort of a you know, a, a part of our project in a sense. Um, this is the bike path. Uh, this is all new, but you can sort of see the, uh, the plan. And this is all kind of scarred up on the hillside uh, because we did a major invasive species removal project up there. So, um, so what you're seeing is a, is a park that is very much under construction and development in this. But again, hopefully you begin to get a sense of the intersection of you know, the sort of the transportation piece, the people piece, the, the, the park road, the bike path um, with the landscape. Um, and the invasive removal tells you that there's, you know, something else going on here besides just, you know, the beauty of the landscape, which is the ecological health of the landscape. Um, this is the egg lawn uh, from a slightly different view. This is uh, our planting plan. Um, so all of this, these areas that you see in green, uh, dark green are not forests today. Those are all part of, in this case, the riparian reforestation. Floyd's Fork is uh, coming down here. Um, there are incredible gravel bars up and down um, uh, the, the creek in this area, which are the beaches of Floyd's Fork. They're also great places to bring people down to the creek edge. So um, there was a lot of intentionality in terms of how we get people down there. But the, the main thing I want to show you, and I hope I can explain this, but um, uh, the the, the, 
the combination of the stream and the architectural plan for the Creekside Center was meant to mimic these kind of broader um, landscape forms. So this is meant to be an eddy. Uh, so that what the planners did is they actually laid the buildings out along the eddy. And I'm going to show you in a minute that at the center of the eddy, um, we put a picnic pavilion with a very specific design. Um, so again, just to the point that the, the planning of the, ar of the park, the architecture of the park, um, has aspects to me uh, that, that, uh, that I think of as public art. So this is the, that the center of that um, designed eddy, if you will. And then this is the picnic pavilion, this kind of nautilus-shaped uh, piece and so it actually, you know, they, it literally sits right at the center of that eddy, and it reflects that idea that you know, sort of that landscape form that you find out on the stream. Um, and then this is the uh, the final design. Great marriage, by the way, uh, between our landscape architects and our building architects. Who, you know, half the time they're in the room going like this, um, and uh, but in this case, they really. Uh, came up with something good. This is the landing area on the bridge. I mentioned that those big stone steps that come down. This is the kind of the architecture there. And one of the things that we wanted to do is we wanted the bridges to be not just a play thing of connectivity, but also a place. And so, you know, we, the, the bike path and the walking path uh, comes across the bridges. We created these spaces. Our, you can see the Louisville Loop with a runner on it. Uh, coming right through here. They're great places to see the stream. Uh, we sat out there last spring and watched sunfish um, actually build their nests where they lay their eggs in the creek. Cause, and you could never see those unless you were 30 feet up or, or 25 feet up looking straight down. Um, again, the landscape plan. Uh, the, this is that the, the bridge. The, the plantings are such that uh, the, the bridge is asymmetrical, so there's kind of a launching side and a landing side. And when you come up over the bridge, you actually can't see beyond it until you hit the peak. And uh, we plant, so we, you know, as part of our riparian reforestation, we bring it up to the edge of the bridge on the launch side, so that you really were, you were hiding that view from you. And then as you come across, uh, we open it on the other side. So again, intentional manipulation of landscape and view. And this, you can't really see this in, you know, in, in detail, but this is the launch side, this is the landing side, and what we've done is filled in plantings here. We do also plant along the stream bank as well, um, even on the landing side. Okay, so that's the, the kind of the big picture, um, a, a grander scale that, you know, my argument that the, the architecture of the park, the landscaping, the reforestation, the creation of view, all of those things um, are things that I, I qualify as public art. Um, the next one is more thinking of it as kind of a platform for public art, which I think uh, might been, have been a little more... Um, what I would, you know, what we've thought the most about. And the, I'm only going to dwell on this point for a minute, um, but uh, we believe in master plans. Um, a lot of master plans sit on a shelf, but I think in a project like this, we need a master plan for public art. And so we have done, it's really not a master plan at this point, it's more a set of guiding principles, but we are setting this project up to be a platform for public art. So that that's one very specific Thing. And this is just all I did was just copied the first two paragraphs. I didn't have a good image to show you. And then within that, we, we kind of break uh, down what the way we think about public art uh, and really the way our planners think about it. Um, and uh, the first category was what they call ephemeral works. And uh, some of you all will probably know these artists. I'll be honest, I, you know, I, I had our architects send us examples, but these are things that don't last for a long time. But we think there's lots and lots of opportunities to um, do these kinds of things um, in very exciting ways. Um, that last one I know is Goldsworthy, who, um, and I have the names if other people are interested um, in them. But we certainly think that this can be a platform for that kind of public art. Um, then we also think there are places where we can actually do more permanent um, both landscape, you know, I talked about these really grand landscape projects, the kinds of things we're doing in the design of the park, but there's also opportunities to do, um, you know, more uh, discrete scale, and then also installed um, art. So, um, 
we like things that, that tie with nature because it fits with the, but the park, but we also think there are places where you could do more urban kinds of, of things. Um, we love details, and you know, at the scale we're working, we don't get to play with details very much, so we think there's a lot of opportunity uh, over time to um, begin to add those. Um, this is just, uh, we do have a few sort of formal garden spots, uh, but within the master plan, only one between two of those, the education and the, and the community center building, we did one. But that idea that over time we begin to fill in some of these spaces with very creative um, sort of botany and, and, uh, and gardening and so on. This is a Philip Johnson piece, that last one that came up that I really like. Um, but the, the idea that we're not only preserving special places, but we're creating them uh, within the park. So again, you know, that, that, that a big project like this, um, over time, people are going to come in and do this anyway. If anybody knows anything about the history of Olmsted's battles in Central Park after he designed it, um, and to be honest, we don't want just a line of statues. Um, you know, we want this to be, that's not to say that there couldn't be a place where we do want a line of statues, but we want to be intentional about it. Um, and I know there was discussion before about sort of, oops, freedom versus control. Um, I think you can be intentional and have both of those. Um, but uh, in any case, this is way beyond anything that we're doing currently, but this is part of the master plan, that it can hopefully ac both accommodate and to some degree control uh, the process that happens. And I also think there's some opportunity still to do some really cool architectural works. Um, and uh, so this is, the, I always get it, is it Thorn Crown or Crown Thorn? I, I may have flipped it. But in any case, this beautiful chapel down in the woods um, in the Ozarks, and uh, so 3,700 acres gives you a big uh, sort of canvas on which to work. It also is a canvas that could be abused, and so our challenge is to think not only within our generation, but going forward, how do we manage this? Um, and the biggest thing we did is we tied our master plan to the deeds on the land. So um, there is a very tight control that you know will outlive me. Um, and it basically, it was pretty simple. We didn't want my evil successor, the mayor's evil successor, whoever it might be, um, to uh, tear up the master plan without serious thought and intentionality. That is, it is possible to, certainly you can add to the master plan, make changes, but it's difficult. Um, and again, that was just sort of looking at the experience of Central Park and the work that the Central Park Conservancy did. Uh, we, we do have areas of flexibility within our master plan. We recognize that you know, recreation changes, uh, taste change, and so on. So we, we sort of created a mix of, of flexibility and control that we'll see. Um, so that's, um, that's my talk. Um, it is, uh, this project is, um, uh, will be complete by the end of 2015, so that all four parks, that 15 mile uh, distance, all of the infrastructure pieces that I've showed you with the exception of all that really cool stuff at the end um, that you know, we're not building, but the silo center, the, you know, the, um, the four parks will be built and open to the public by the end of 2015. So in addition to being one of the largest, you know, 100% funded. It's also a very fast moving project um, and one that um, last year we, we projected 100,000 visits. We had 275,000 visits with a playground and about uh, a small soccer complex of about eight fields. So um, there's a lot of pent up demand um, uh, for these kinds of resources, particularly things like bike paths and walking paths, not the really heavily designed ball field type infrastructure, but um, the ones that allow sort of individuals to come out and, or groups and do what they want. So I think we have a little time for questions, um, and I'm happy to hear questions. Um, you will not uh, hurt my feelings on public art, as I said. I really, uh, you know, I, I uh, don't know a whole lot about it beyond the specific things we've done, so I'm very interested in, in feedback and comments from, you know, people who think about it all the time. Yes? How are you going to put the word out to sculptors? Is it going to be a call for artists? And when? Um, uh, <laughs> well, so let me see here. 
I mentioned our master plan for public art. I said it's, a, it's guiding principles. This is it. It's three pages. Um, and it is not yet board approved. So I really don't have a specific answer. We do, however, uh, have in this, and it, it's interesting that you asked this question, um, and I can tell you this, there are five basic approaches to the acquisition of art for the uh, Parklands. Direct commission, RFQ selection, um, which would be um, you know, public call for entries and evaluation of qualifications, RFP selection, where we'd give more sort of information and so on, um, acquisition and donation. So uh, basically it's highly flexible and we haven't figured it out. Um, the only thing I would say is that um, as an organization we spend a lot of time on governance and we try to think through um, very carefully any, particularly when we step into something new um, and typically the first thing we do is we go look for best practices. So for this, as this would become reality, my guess is, is that we would go to New York and talk to the Central Parks Conservancy and go to, you know, and begin to understand um, projects that have been successful. Um, somebody mentioned sort of there have been the ones they've seen that are good and the ones that are bad. We'd probably look at some of both of those. And then out of that, um, develop a very intentional strategy. So, it, you know, once we do that, then we move pretty fast. But there's still a lot of work to be done for us to, to be at the point of, of a specific call. Yes? Let me urge you to think about artists in residence programs. Thank you. And we have—that's we something we have talked about. Um, I think one of the most interesting things to me about this is that we have this long, long view, you know, this really big, distant view of, of its development. It seems like it would be so interesting if the temporal dimension or a long view about the art. Somehow, or that if the art in some way uh, dealt with time, I, it just seems like it could be, or, or that you required that it have to last for 2,000 years. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's a very that's a very good um, understanding and application. I mean, of our strategy, we do tend to think. In, I mean, I'm trained as a historian. That's probably the o the only useful thing that my historical background brought to this was um, we do, I mean, if you look at, at Central Park, you know, or you look at the old pictures of Tyler Park or Cherokee Park in Louisville, you know, and uh, this is a, something we're going to have a challenge with. I mean, the trees we're planting, you know, the new trees are two inch caliper trees. They don't look like a lot right now and it's going to take 30 to 50 years. Those forests in that Photoshop image are not going to be mature forests, you know, for 60, 70, 80, 100 years. Um, flip side is we do have some really nice 70 or 80 year old forest which in 100 years is going to be old growth for us um, and it will begin to take on the characteristics of that. So, uh, but to apply that to art is a very interesting and, and good idea. Uh, in terms of this long term thinking, uh, what are your interactions with other area resources like Vermont? Um, we have uh, Good. Re I mean, no formal or direct relationship. I actually am meeting um, on Monday morning with Paul Coombe. Some of you will know he's a retired economist uh, from U of L, and somebody from Bernheim, and an outside expert um, that we that we may do a little study on the economic value of parks. Um, that would sort of be us and Metro Parks, and um, so at that level, we have an educational discussion with them about sort of different ways, things they can do that we can't do and vice versa so we don't sort of duplicate each other's programming. So that kind of relationship. And what about in terms of long-range planning? Are they, well, what are the models in terms of long-range planning? Because that, I, I would like to echo the remark, that's one of the most intriguing aspects, it seems to me, in your endeavor. The models for long-range planning in terms of... Other parks or other entities or Japanese corporations or whatever. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, Olmsted thought long term. Um, I think, you know, not just in terms of his park, but in terms of the city. Uh, the city of New York thought long term. There was a great um, uh, exhibit in the city of the Museum of the, Mu Museum of the City of New York on the, called The Greatest Grid last fall. It was all about sort of how they projected their growth out a hundred years. I mean, I don't know that there's a lot of models. I know Patty Claire is working on a visioning project for the city. I mean, I think uh, our, we live in a very fast moving economy and so sometimes I think, you know, there's this big clash between planners and 
sort of economic actors, but I don't think that means that we shouldn't plan. I mean, I, I, I think it's kind of a lost art, and I think a lot of it is because we have lost faith in our ability to grow. Um, we assume that growth always equals bad. Um, and, you know, I don't share that assumption. I can certainly see the evidence of it, but I'm an optimist at heart, and I think that, um, you know, a project like ours does not guarantee the finest urban edge in the country, but the lack of a project like ours does guarantee that we will build the same urban edge that everybody else has built. So you have to start somewhere and you have to, um, but um, I mean, uh, Bloomberg did a great job with the um, Plan YC in New York, which is, I think, you know, particularly given the complexity of New York City, a remarkable achievement in the sense that they planned it and they actually are taking action on it, you know. So, but I, we didn't look to, I mean, I'll be honest, I mean, I, as a historian, I knew about Olmsted and, I, you know, he, he's kind of been our model. Now, we, Central Parks Conservancy is our model when it comes to funding and, and maintenance and, um, you know, some of the things that they do really, really well that most other parks don't do well. I know you have documented well the 400 places where mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, when Bob Hill retired from the Career Journal, he came to us and said he would like to help. And so we hired him on a part-time uh, basis. We bought him, brought him into the digital age. We bought him a little MP3 recorder. Bob Hill, for those from out of town, was a, a long-time columnist at the Courier Journal, and he's kind of a folksy uh, guy. But he um, he goes out and interviews people, and so he's uh, you know his he's got his current group are two 90-something women who grew up in, uh, along kind of in Fern Creek in the southern part of the park. And then we made a small grant to the Filson Historical Society. Uh, so Bob records it, we transcribe it, we give it to the Filson, uh, they archive it. Um, and then usually Bob will write a little sort of, we call it Bob Hill's Floyd's Fork Journal that we put in our e-newsletter. And But we have about 20 narratives that he's written, but more importantly, we have those very specific interviews um, that, and he's done, it's everybody from Sally Brown to, um, you know, the sort of the, the founders of this project to people that have lived out along Floyd's Fork, you know, in, in some cases. Um, and uh, the most remarkable thing he found was a 12-page letter that a dying man wrote to his daughter. Uh, he had a fifth grade education and the first six pages he writes, he tells you the story of his life growing up on Floyd's Fork. Um, the last six pages, he retells it imagining himself as a tree. Um, and it is one of the most wonderful pieces of literature that we've ever found, and we found it because Bob, uh, and so one of the things we're trying to figure out now is how do we get not just the, the transcripts of the oral history, but the actual, these kinds of documents to the filth. And so we're working with Jim Holmberg there to, to try to do it. Um, uh, fascinating history um, out there for, you know, in all kinds of different ways. So you, you talk a lot about how Olmstead is the influence on this project. What, are there any sort of contemporary examples that you're looking at? Uh, in terms of, well, I mean, <laughs> yes and no. I mean, when we went through the process to pick our architects, we started with about 40 architectural firms. So we did, we had a very, you know, sort of wide uh, ranging look and we looked at a lot of different projects that different firms um, had worked on. Um, so, in there, I mean, yes, in terms, I mean, if you kind of get off the grand, you know, shaping the city for the next hundred years, which is mostly where we look at Olmsted, I mean, the architects don't want to be Olmsted, right? They want to be, you know, they want to be, you know, the next generation and um, kind of out at the edge. And Olmsted, you know, he was, he was an environmentalist, but 19th century ecology was not 21st century ecology. Um, and so um, we look at a lot of models. Um, that aren't necessarily urban parks. I mean, when we think about the ecology, um, you know, we, we will go look at state park management or national park management. So there are lots of other models that we use. We're in a weird 
place because we have urban problems and we have rural problems. We census the deer. We're supposed to have 35 deer per square mile. We have 175 deer per square mile. So, you know, how do you manage deer in a, in a, in a pretty urban place? So we do look at a lot of other models. They tend to be a little more at kind of specific levels of the project, if that makes sense. So um, we agree with you. The other thing that, and again, there are people who know a lot more about this than me, but you know, I'd like to see a, a resurgence of American landscape architecture. When you look at a lot of the models in landscape architecture now, they are intensely urban and very European, and they're wonderful. I'm not, there's not a criticism in that, but we have you know, the, the, you know, sort of Olmsted's tradition, the Prairie School. I mean, there's a lot of, um, uh, and, and again, I, this may be completely off base, and I, I'm happy to be challenged on it, but I, I, you know, I, I feel that there's a lot of um, reluctance to kind of break out of that kind of post-modern, post-industrial um, uh, vocabulary. This project obviously lent itself to a more pastoral um, uh, vocabulary, but you know, I mean, again, I don't know if that's right, but, um, but I certainly agree with you, and I, you know, I hope that, you know, Landscape architects are, you know, uh, have many opportunities, to, whether they're urban or pastoral or whatever. So, did you bring any uh, mountain bikers to urge the paths and the pedestrians and the uh, bikers? Because I know they can see going at 24 miles an hour versus on bikes. It's a, it, it is. A, we did bring in experts. Um, they are together. I mean, you can, you know, you can find, you will find bikers and walkers on the Louisville Loop. We did build it uh, pretty wide. Um, there's lots of different opinions about how you, you know, um, do that. Um, but we chose that, you know, that we felt that, that w we felt that realistically they were going to be together. Um, and also, we were part of the Louisville Loop project, which makes. Uh, the same assumption. Um, on each trail system, we brought in an expert. So on our paddling trail, we brought in a company out of Indianapolis called Pros Consulting. Um, initially, they wanted to build a whitewater park. Um, we didn't want a whitewater park. We wanted sort of the authentic Floyd's Fork experience. Um, on the mountain bike trails, we brought in IMBA, which is the International Mountain Biking Association. Our goal is to design the highest ranked mountain bike system east of the Mississippi. So they have a gold, silver, bronze, can't get to gold if you don't have 3,000 feet of vertical elevation. It's a very west of the Mississippi centric view of the world. Um, but we can get to a high silver and we think we will. We, we're not building all of that right now, but um, we have it in our master plan. So again, each piece we reach for an expert. Um, do you, because these art installations hold potential to um, affect people in the long run, would it seem as though they should reflect our culture as local public people rather than um, art that's been derived from the European aspects or across the nation? Because there are cultures here, like Native American Indians and the culture today, and things that would seem almost reflected in the landscape and the architecture that is left behind. Do you take that into consideration? I, I don't, we haven't specifically talked about, I mean, in terms like in our historical research and interpretation and that kind of thing, we've delved into those different, um, you know, sort of different cultures and, you know, there was a slave tradition out there, so there's, I mean, there's a lot of, um, uh, in terms of public art, I think that would be, you know, one of the things that you could sort of make part of the, the discussion is, you know, what, you know, that's kind of that 
you know, sort of free space versus more directed. Um, but certainly those are themes that um, are important to us historically and culturally, and I, I don't see any reason why they don't fit. Um, okay. uh, we need to give our, uh, another round of applause to Dan Jones. Please remember my plea about the uh, evaluation form because we really, uh, the Center for Arts and Culture Partnerships is truly dedicated to making uh, our activities responsive to the needs of the community. We're not, we're not about doing long academic papers with six semicolons in the title. Uh -oh. So. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so uh, please, uh, please fill out the evaluation. Um, I have the pleasant task of introducing our moderator, who then will uh, introduce uh, the uh, speakers in our last session. Yasmin Siddiqui is an independent curator. She's worked recently on installations of the work of Consuelo Constaneda and the work of Do Husu. She was formerly the planner for the Commission on Public Art in Louisville. She's also worked at the Andy Warhol Foundation, the Storefront for Art and Architecture in New York, and the Vita de Vith Center for Contemporary Art in Rotterdam. She also has had very extensive experience as a writer and editor, both in the United States and in Cairo, uh, Egypt. We're very thrilled that uh, Yasmin now lives in Louisville and is available to uh, act as moderator for our last session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for this invitation to moderate um, a conversation about among an esteemed group of academics here. Oh, really? Okay. Is that better? Okay. Well, I have just thanked Peter for inviting me to moderate this conversation among four really remarkable thinkers and practitioners in a variety of fields. I'll introduce them momentarily. I also want to thank Tiffany Carboneau for the technology, without which I would have no gravelly pictures. I've quickly pulled. Um, Peter's decision to bring together a cross-section of the university speaks volumes to the school's perspective on knowledge and its role in the creation of art and the development of public space. Today's round table include, and I will introduce them at more length momentarily, John Hale from Liberal Studies, uh, John Cumler, down from history, David Simpson, here, Public Urban Affairs, and Keith Mountain from Geography. Um, the ra this round table, its purpose is to forefront the importance of a cross-disciplinary exchange, specifically as related to, as the whole day has been, the creation of public art projects. Um, we've divided this hour into two parts, however they may, we'll see where that two parts, what kind of a third or halves. Um, we'll begin with some prepared comments, which will be followed by a moderated conversation, where I hope that the floor opens up as it has so far today a number of times in, in an interesting way. Um, the root issue to keep in mind throughout these presentations and the conversation that will follow is the challenge and the demands made of artists, primarily administrators in a community, as well the desires to participate and live in a place that is understood and interpreted from many perspectives, be they historical, environmental, social, or spatial. So with this objective in mind, before delving into their specific research areas, I'd like to focus this round table back directly into art, just for a quick second, um, by presenting three projects that occur in the public sphere in different ways uh, that uh, were only were created primarily through the exploring of the com exploring the combining of art and research. Um, and to, this is an image from Storefront for Art and Architecture in 2006, and it's kind of an interesting confluence. Storefront honored Mary Miss this year for the 30th anniversary, which is exciting. Storefront's a very important um, space in New York that now for 30 years has really been working hard to grapple with issues at the intersection of art and architectural practices. So Pia Lindman, this is her project called Fascia. 
She is a performance and video artist. She developed Fascia for Storefront. She had been a fellow at CAVS, the Center of Advanced Visual Studies at MIT, where she had previously, so just before this one, collaborated with the robotics department in a series of embodiments of interactions between human beings and robots. Shortly thereafter, she gets to Fascia, and this project unfolded as a series of live performance, video recordings, and drawings that engaged in a visual dialogue with Stephen Hall and Vito Acconci's iconic facade that blends and breaks private and public. Um, like Akanshi and Hall, she challenged the traditional notion of facade as a continuing membrane that simultaneously separates and erotically joins the inside with the outside. That, that was in 2006, and then it, the next project, the Ring Dome, um, is in 2008, and this is a, was a design by Min Suk Cho that was realized by the storefront folk and staff uh, in its actual form uh, made of hula hoops. Um, he, so what is, I think, notable here is that the space was then programmed for 26 consecutive days. And in that time, there was a range of practitioners, thinkers, makers, and um, artists who, who animated the space, really uh, emphasizing how social spaces are created, what is at their core, and the essential exchange necessary for that to happen. And the last project I'll throw up is um, from 2000, and t oops, oh, there's Marilyn Mentor. Um, 2010, um, Doho Su. He's well known for his exquisite large scale sculptures. Um, he decided to break away. This was around in 2009. He was in Berlin as a resident at, in the Dodd program. And he, he wanted to work on figuring out how to represent his research, research methods. We worked together. He began the bridge project then. And it continues to evolve until today. And we'll go on and on. And this works within his, a, a larger and expansive speculation project under which there's the umbrella of perfect home and you have the bridge. Um, it's, what he's done is he's collaborated with marine biologists, engineers, uh, all kinds of different thinkers, um, hazard, people who deal with disaster, um, to develop and design propositions for a bridge that goes from Seoul to New York and what it would look like. For uh, uh, the storefront exhibition, he had four propositions. Uh, thousands upon thousands of images built up this show um, reflecting his, his, different, his thoughts and approaches as a library. And then uh, in Liverpool of the same year, the project is realized as this physical sculptural intervention in a kind of grand scale that, that is uh, an interesting outcome that people expect of an artist. Um, and so now, with these ideas in mind and these examples, I'd like to turn to our esteemed participants. Uh, I'd like to begin with John Hale, who I will introduce. I'll introduce each one just before they pop up, so that because they're, they're all so distinct. Um, Dr. John Hale is Director of Liberal Studies in the College of Art and Science here at U of L. He is an archaeologist with fieldwork experience at prehistoric sites in the Ohio River Valley, as well as sites in Scandinavia, Britain, Portugal, Greece, Turkey, and underwater sites in the Mediterranean and Guatemala. It gets better. His work has three areas of focus, sacred landscapes, oracle sites, and ancient ships and shipwrecks. Um, his upcoming essay, which I noticed over at the height about Matthew Rone is testament to his engagement with artists and their, uh, the articulation of their practice. Um, for today, he'll discuss public art and landscaping as practiced in the ancient city of Cah Cahokia? Is that oh, OK? On the Mississippi River about a thousand years ago. Um, I look very forward. Let me, now we have to switch machines. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm wondering if we, could, if we could have the lights down, please. Do this as quickly as I can. When 
UNESCO of the United Nations created the, the World Heritage Register of World Heritage Cultural and Natural Sites. Many Americans were stunned and puzzled that the number one site in the United States chosen for this register by the international panel that made the selections was a site most Americans had never heard of, Cahokia, at the western edge of the state of Illinois. I want to try to convince you that the World Heritage Register people knew what they were talking about. Just outside and across the Mississippi River from the modern sprawl of St. Louis is a pastoral landscape of farms, small towns, and this one great prehistoric city, reaching its height about a thousand years ago. At its height, it numbered in population between 20 and 30,000 people, centered around a downtown complex, a ceremonial zone that we're going to be looking at, that was framed by great earth mounds. And you see at the bottom there the profile of the great mound called Monk's Mound because Trappists built a monastery on top. Monk's Mound has a footprint as big as the Great Pyramid in Egypt, is a hundred feet high and we'll get some more details about its building in a moment. You see it here from the air with the modern pass that can take you and yes I hope it will be you very soon to its summit. All these mounds look back to an earlier mound building tradition in the Midwest of effigy mounds. These were built by hunting cultures 500 years before Cahokia who looked to the earth, to animals like the snake, this one being a quarter of a mile long through the hills around Bainbridge, Ohio, and who created effigies of bears, eagles, turtles in their earthworks. When we get to Cahokia, we are with a great farming civilization that looks to the heavens. They have four holy directions, north, south, east, west, and they have gone in for geometry in their art rather than these naturalistic expressions of the earlier mounds. The white is our Midwest, the blue is the Mississippi and its tributaries, those brown lumps are mounds. Except for Cahokia, most are gone. I was talking with Leslie about the sad fact that downtown St. Louis used to boast great geometrical mounds. They were zestily taken down in the 19th century to level low spots in the urban sprawl. People first began to realize that around the big monk's mound, that square mound on the Illinois side of the river, there must have been people because they found artifacts, these extraordinary stone artifacts, some of the most beautiful ever created anywhere in the world, that came up every time the, the fields were plowed in the spring. And digging deeper, they found the remains of houses. These were not like the earlier hunters' effigy mounds. This was obviously the center of a community, not a remote place where folk would go to worship as if on a pilgrimage. You can see the Cahokians went in for square houses and posts to hold up their thatch roofs. And it was the, these simple houses that were first excavated. They've been reconstructed here in the wonderful interpreter's center there at Cahokia. And given a timeline, the earliest ones seem to have been built in the 700s and the last ones before the site's abandonment in the 1300s. So we have about half a millennium of human history here at this extraordinary site. And we here catch a glimpse of it in an artist's rendering of what it may have looked like near the beginning when the scatter of houses was still widespread and the number of people fairly few. These people gathered together to create these mounds. Anthropologists, archaeologists, we feel certain that these were built by the people themselves, willingly. Please think away, you will Brenner, Ten Commandments, overseers with whips, slaves driven to drag big stones here and there to create pyramids. It wasn't that way in Egypt. It certainly was not that way among the Cahokian Indians. One of the ways of expressing the greatness of your tribe, your nation in this case, is to create great monuments that no ordinary folk could have attempted. So this is what it looked like originally, a series of platforms in a fairly square layout with a projecting front, which was the steep ascent onto that platform. 
The great Sun, S-U-N, who was the chief of the Cahokians, lived atop this. Whenever he came down, he was carried on a litter, shoulder high, because his feet, being divine, must never touch the ordinary earth. And the sides of this are oriented perfectly to the cardinal directions. I don't know why the artist decided to put the builders in blue jeans, but this is trying to give you some notion of what lies behind this extraordinary earthwork. Estimates on building it range from a century to one or two years. So you can see there's still no scholarly consensus except that the radiocarbon dates of vegetable material that got packed in the baskets as they were piled up and tamped down indicates just a few years is probably correct. 22 million cubic feet of earth piled up, tamped down, creating these various levels of their center of the universe. And here you can see it as it might have been could we hover over it a thousand years ago and see the great mound there at the top center within its enclosure and all of those neighborhoods scattered around it. We're going to be looking at some of these others, but I want you to notice now how the mounds are used here not like the old snakes and bears and eagles as the focus points. The mounds are the frame. The focus point in this urban place is that great flat expanse of land that they surround. The Mississippi ran on the western side. The residences tended to, of the elite tend to be clustered either on the mounds or along the river with access to that life-giving water. And from the river came the commerce that brought them obsidian from Yellowstone, copper from Lake Superior, conch shells from the Gulf of Mexico, mica from the Smoky Mountains. This was truly an international center. And rising above those canoes that brought the wealth of the New World to this place was the towering Great Mound of Cahokia. It looks almost surreal today, these artificial mountains or hills or plateaus from which the elite, the leaders of this community could present themselves in all their glorious costumes, carrying the emblems of that sky worship and sun worship at the tops of steps, on the edges of platforms, to the mass of the people in the great square below. It served many purposes. It was a gathering place. It was a place for dancing which was very important as a social unifier among all Native American peoples. It was a place for sacrifice. It was a place for games and feasts. And you can see there the central game area. They played a game called Chunky and some of their finest stone artifacts were the little discs that were spun across the earth and then you would throw a spear after it in a sort of prehistoric form of bocce, trying to make sure your spear ended exactly where that disc was going to land. Presiding over all was that lineage descended from the sun who spent its members spending most of its time on the mounds but at times coming down to dance in these eagle feathered costumes in the middle of this great place. And we can see on this little tablet which was probably used as a stamp for imprinting designs on cloth one of these masked and the mask is very clear one of these masked eagle men stretching out his arm to which a wing has been attached. You can also see the ear spools there. These are people who loved ornament, loved badges of rank. And here we see the chunky game with those lovely bagel shaped chunky stones and a 19th century picture of the game still being played in the Mississippi Valley hundreds of years after the site of Cahokia was abandoned. Citywide feasts were an essential element of the public place. Those pavilions that you see with their thatched roofs were put up temporarily just for a seasonal gathering that would bring perhaps tens of thousands of people together. They would feast on deer, on fish, on corn, beans, and squash. The plenty of the entire Mississippi Valley poured out in these grand ceremonial festivals. And the art was brought by the celebrants. From each home came, you see on the left, the cups in which during this past year, the residues have finally been chemically analyzed. This was the famous black drink talked about by the Europeans who first encountered Indians in the American Southeast as an intoxicant that gave superhuman strength to fighting men and was made from various very bitter herbs in their community. And then 
this most beautiful Madonna figure, this mother and child, uh, she would have been filled with a corn beverage and that would have been poured out by the women of the family. This was very much a place where the entire population would gather for these great ceremonial meals. That there was more to the grandeur of Cahokia and its public landscaping became clear when a series of giant cedar and cypress logs were found in the continuing excavations. And nearby was found a circle of post holes with the rotted remains of those logs standing in them representing places where these logs had been set up. It turned out that they had been set up in circles with one giant pointer in the middle. And this would take us back, this artist's rendering, to just how gargantuan this undertaking was to cut and trim the logs, bring them from the forest to this place, and erect them in the circle. They are off to the west of the Great Mounds, so that by standing at the circle, what do you see beyond you on the eastern horizon, framed and calibrated by the top of that mound, you see the sunrises throughout the year. So this is a Stonehenge created here in the Americas out of wooden logs. And if you will look at this, we've seen it before, but now look over to the far left and you will see Woodhenge there occupying the westernmost place between the urban center and the river. And here we see a midsummer sunrise popping up from that entry point on the south side of the Great Mound and still drawing today hundreds of people who have revived a great interest in Cahokia. More and more of these circles are being found all the time. We are reasoning, realizing that the geometrical sculpting and marking of this landscape went far beyond anything that was appreciated by the 20th century archaeologists who worked there. And this little figure from the uh, Virginia a colony uh, that showed Virginia Indians in the 18th century, actually this is 17th century, using a similar circle, it's for a dance. These were places of public participation, joy, and celebration. So perhaps the most interesting element of the Woodhenge is that there wasn't just one. It was rebuilt again and again and again. It was as if the building of this place was as important as its presence and that every generation wanted its own chance to contribute to the majesty of Cahokia. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Now, we will move on to John Cumbler. Um, Dr. Cumbler is professor in the Debar Department of History. His accomplish accomplishments in research and teaching point to his global investigative approach to his thinking about our built environment. He holds a number of positions, including in 2008, the John Adams Distinguished Fulbright Professor in the Netherlands. He has published extensively, contributing six significant books on social, labor, economic, and environmental history. He teaches both environmental history and historical geography. Today, Dr. Kumbler will discuss the role of public space in a diversified city and how art can fit into that larger perspective. Do you? I don't the oh, great. Okay, so we can leave it. So we'll close, the close it. Too. Yeah, the lights up a little bit. Um, so could you turn up the lights? Mm -hmm. Okay. You can pop everything. All right. And I'll try to be very sensitive to my time limitations. I was a visiting professor in the Netherlands a few years back, as was mentioned, and in my city there were dozens of open areas and parks having the densest population in Europe. The Dutch are very good about open public space and littered across almost all of these open spaces and parks were works of art, mostly various forms of sculptures, and, you know, mo mobile, mobiles and other sort of uh, abstract sculptures and as well as more realistic ones. They weren't just cluttered in the center of the city but were spread across the whole city in parks that were also spread across the whole city. Works of art were down by the canals, they were down, they were in big parks, they were in little parks, they were in neighborhoods of all the various social classes of the city I lived in. The use of urban space in the Netherlands is very dramatic. 
because land is dear, the Dutch husband it and control its use much more aggressively than we do in the United States. They hold open space more dearly than we do. Um, of course, having canals weave through your city gives, opens a city up, but it's not just the canals uh, that open up Dutch cities. It's the fact that the, the state and the municipal communities have an aggressive commitment to uh, public space and to, to keeping public space uh, open. In this country, we tend to hold private space dear um, and use <clears throat> and, and privilege private space as opposed to public space. We give subsidies for individuals and companies to take abandoned land or less intensely use land and convert it to taxable private um, land. In the Netherlands, it's, Netherlands is just the opposite. Abandoned land is seized by public entities and converted into public space because there's this desperate search to keep public space available. Our, our officials are very reluctant to even assert public rights over public land. If you drive down Eastern Parkway, you'll, Parkway, you'll notice that, um, that the, the parkway um, has homes coming up to the parkway, and the owners of those homes have asserted a kind of informal property right all the way to the road. But in fact, the parkway controls a huge chunk of the land that is in the, that those people think are their private lawns, but in fact are public property. And I have been advocating for years, um, to no avail, um, that the city should just seize that land and put bikeways, bike paths on that public land. Uh, but I was told by one alderman, oh, those neighbors would never go for it. It's not their land, but that's a different issue. <laughs> related to that is the idea of, of privilege, uh, related to the idea of privileging public space is the idea that open space should be used in a variety of ways, including nice restaurants, which are in public parks, as well as works of art. Public space is for the larger uh, aesthetic, not just for utilitarian purposes, golf courses or, or, or um, um, running paths. Of course, the purchase of art subsidizes the arts community um, and gives encouragement to that um, community. Although Louisville, in fact, is better than most American cities, it does share with American cities the, the, the <coughs> privileging of private space over public space. We have much less public space in, even in Louisville than a typical Dutch city would have in terms of its population um, per capita. But we do have public space and we should explore how to utilize that space to advance multiple purpose, purposes, including furthering the arts, enlarging, uh, enlarging the aesthetic of the city. All right, before we move on to that issue, which I'll talk about in a second, I want to just mention one other thing about an American condition. Our cities, including Louisville, are rigorously segregated and segmented by race and class. Our urban space reflects that. So any attempt to think about urban space and public art must also address the issue of race and class, race and class segmentation, so that we don't privilege some communities over other communities, because we might feel more comfortable in some communities than in other communities. We should also work to make our urban space as, as racially and class fluid as possible. One more thought about public space and public art. Governmental attempts to revitalize urban space often fail. Successes are often unintended or a consequence of unintended activities. But careful and imaginative thought coupled with realistic expectation, limited goals can oftentimes lead to impressive results. The River Park is the best example of that. If I were to give an award to someone in this city, it would be, or the group in the city, it would be the, pe the people behind the River Park. That is a phenomenal success. 30 years ago, that was a wasteland. People avoided that whole area. And I'm not that smart a person, but I couldn't figure out what could possibly be done with that area except maybe just, you know, drop a bomb in it. But someone had the imagination and the creativity to think of how they could utilize that land and transform it from a wasteland to what is now an urban gem, the river. And we should all applaud 
the people behind that river park because it's a fabulous accomplishment. The river park is, is, I think, the best example of how you can do real things with imagination, creativity, limited vision, uh, and support from governmental uh, institutions. The River Park has a mixed clientele. It's one of the most racially and class mixed parks in our city. You go to the River Park, you're going to see people of all ages, of all classes, and of all races. It's a tremendous success. It has created an urban Garden River Park from the Bell of Louisville east practically to Frankfurt Avenue. But in saying that, I want to emphasize that it is a green strip that stretches east, not west. West of, the, of downtown, the river walk goes under the expressway and stretches along an unsavory area, uh, unsafe until it sort of reaches the, the Western Railroad Bridge. So I'll open up excuse me, for a while there. Uh, but then it begins to decline again. And as you move further west, the river walk gets more and more unsavory. More and, more, and, and, and that is not just a public policy issue. Um, I mean, it's, it's partly, you know, economics and, and poor people and all that. But it's also a public policy because it is degenerated. It is, it is worse off now than it was ten years ago. If you walk it now, you will notice that it is really falling apart and that's a public um, the failure of the public sphere. Public space has to be used imaginatively and re realistically. Um, it made sense, for example, to put the skate park uh, on the eastern side of Route 65, since skateboarding is really a white thing, it's not a black thing. I mean, black kids don't skateboard like white kids do, so if you put a skateboard, it's silly to put it in the West End. Okay. <clears throat> Here are my suggestions for art in the city of Louisville, which like, like all of my suggestions, will be ignored, but I'll throw them out anyway. I suggested that we save the river fountain and, and apply for a grant from EPA and claim we're cleaning the river. It's aerating the river rather than claim it was a work of art. But uh, they just took it out instead of taking my suggestion. What we need to do in Louisville is look at where we need public space and we need to use that public space creatively. And I think the west and the southwest of Louisville is in desperate need of revitalization of the public space. And what I would suggest is that the city be aggressive about seizing and buying land in the west and southwest of Louisville and create a giant urban garden. And think of urban art, public art, as gardens as well. Um, flower gardens. And not just sort of public gardens like you think of an English garden, but I'm talking about marketable gardens. That is, make out plots of land. Lo uh, find locals who will take those plots of land and start raising flowers to sell them in flower markets and to sell them to flower dealers. Convert that whole region, that sort of heavy industrial abandoned region, into a massive flower garden, private and public. Have public gardens and private gardens. Encourage locals to be employed in those gardens to raise the, the, the flowers. Uh, encourage locals to set up their own flower gardens in that area. You don't have to worry so much about pollutants and toxins in the soil if you're raising flowers. And flowers is a good investment for a community to make. If you ever go to a farmer's market, the longest line and the highest prices are at the flower stall rather than the, the veggie stall. You want local community involved? I would surround your flower garden and mix your flower garden with public art, with, with sculptures and other forms of public art. I would involve the local community in decisions about where to place that public art and what kind of public art you want. As I said, I would have an internship to get kids involved in this project. Um, and I would define public art in the broadest possible strokes. Sorry about that. Um, which I, includes flowers and gardens and the whole idea of marketable flowers as well as, as, as sort of public garden flowers. <clears throat> Trans the other thing I would do is I would start, start working on the river walk to the west. Clearly, it got to do something about under the expressway. And what I would do if I had all the money in the world is I'd cantilever that walk out over the river and get it away from the expressway and make it a more aesthetic place to walk. All right, and whatever we do, 
don't build the insanely stupid downtown bridge. <laughs> Fix the old bridge. Invest in public transportation. Let me just say, if we build that bridge, we'll be as smart as, a, as the state of New York, which widened the Erie Canal at the end of the 19th century. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Um, David Simpson is next. And he's the chair of the Department of Urban and Public Affairs. He's been at UofL since 99. He's been active in the region on planning and sustainable development issues. Dr. Simpson was a founding faculty in the creation of UofL's Master of Urban Planning degree. And he has been a quick response researcher for the National Science Foundation, responding with funded field research following the World Trade Center collapse, Hurricane Isabel, on the Atlantic coast, and two projects following Hurricane Katrina. For today, he'll discuss public art from the perspective of urban planning and disaster. I've got it. Are you handy? Okay. I'm handy. Okay. While I'm hooking this up, I'll tell you that Yasmin uh, emailed and said, uh, oh, Five minutes is what we're going to look for in terms of uh, uh -huh. to, accommodate conversation. to accommodate conversation. And I thought, well, she's invited John Cumbler, John Hale, Keith Mountain, and myself. Uh, the odds of that actually happening are like Harvard winning a game in the first round of the NCAA. So <laughs> who knows? Miracles may happen. Uh, even up. OK. So um, what I'd like to do is just uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, we can bring down the lights just a little bit. It's, it, I do have just a few brief comments, but I want to talk a little bit about public art from the view of urban planning and also disasters, because while those may not seem obvious, we had some talks this morning and projects uh, discussed this morning about uh, using uh, art in both remembrance and in uh, education as to how we deal with hazards in our environment. So um, in terms of, of public art and its role with urban planning, um, there are some historical roots. Uh, Dan Jones in his talk discussed uh, the Burnham Plan. Uh, at the turn of the century, when we really started urbanizing our uh, cities, there were you know, terrible overcrowding and, and slum conditions in many parts of the industrialized cities. And it led to <clears throat> something called the City Beautiful Movement at the turn of the century, where we were really looking for ways to beautify our urban spaces, and it was exemplified in the World Columbian Exposition in 1893 in Chicago, where they built um, a city called the White City um, with alabaster architecture and trying to show that you could plan, execute, and demonstrate a livable urban area that didn't have slums and blight. Um, that translated, at least in the way it was happening in the rest of the country, into the civic improvement movement and the garden cities movements where uh, the effort to beautify uh, urban spaces um, was seen as a, as a worthwhile goal for communities. And, and that translated into all kinds of projects that were both public space and private space in terms of uh, civic improvement. Um, Ebenezer Howard and the, the Garden City movement, uh, I think what we saw today from, from Dan Jones and the, the idea of the Olmsted Park concept and also trying to build on that urban fringe uh, connections to nature that we may lose in the urbanized areas uh, is, uh, you know, 100 years ago was the Garden City concept. Today is what we're seeing realized in the 21st century parks uh, efforts. Uh, so there's still some of that resonating. Um, today. Um, in terms of w what we understood public art to be, at least at the turn of the century, it was really in our government spaces, our civic spaces, and it was more monument and grand vista kind of planning. So uh, it was more art as monument, uh, you know, in, in, a, big, in a big scale um, and less as public art as experienced uh, on a day-to-day -day level. So it was a destination kind of experience. And then uh, all, the, all the different examples we've seen today, as well as this symposia today, is really art, public art as it's been transformed is more experiential, or at least most of us think it should be, um, and it's an engaged activity uh, that we uh, want people to experience and interact with. 
And so the one, I was trying to think, well, what in Louisville is, is a good example of that? And I thought, well, Gallup Palooza was a, an interesting project that most of you are probably familiar with, where artists were uh, commissioned to create uh, horses uh, to go around the city, and, uh, and they were placed all about. Uh, no, I, I don't. I don't know why WLKY thought my computer needed to do that, but uh, so, and that's the last slide of that. Um, so that's, that's sort of a quick view, you know, over the last hundred years we've really been able to move from what was really public art as monument to now public art as experience, and I think that's important to think about. Um, in, in, the other, in another vein, looking at public art in a disaster context, um, I think it's important to note that disasters, if they're large enough, affect people regionally and, and tend to touch many, many lives and not just individuals. So that there's um, shared feelings, there's shared concern, there's shared grief in, in these experiences. And, and so um, one example of art that comes out of that is what I'm, I'm just calling spontaneous art and um, the experience with the World Trade Center and its collapse uh, in all of the rubble as they were beginning to clean this up. I was there uh, two weeks after doing some field research um, about it, but they found in that rubble what looked to be a cross in those um, iron girders and uh, that was taken and used as a, a public piece of monument or art and memorial um, and used, that's going to be incorporated into the Ground Zero Museum. Um, so that's, it's an example of, of art that, that was sort of discovered and then incorporated. Um, but a lot of what happens in these events is the desire to, to commemorate, the desire to express uh, sympathy or uh, the desire to um, um, mourn in a meaningful way. And so um, in, in the World Trade Center there were these uh, missing person walls where people placed pictures and descriptions of their loved ones hoping that they were just missing and not uh, deceased. Um, but those, those were then transformed in several cases of uh, displays and memorials uh, that took pictures, names, and other kinds of um, uh, formulations of those, of those uh, depictions and, and made exhibits in places where people could experience and reflect um, and in many cases uh, grieve. So those are just a couple of images of those uh, things. Now um, another display or public art Memorial was the one that was built after the Oklahoma City bombing um, event and this is uh, someone there that's pausing to reflect. There are names on each of these chairs um, and statues and this is a, a picture of, of what it looks like at night. It's uh, lit underneath with the name. And so these are uh, uh, both uh, public art in one sense but also a way for the community to uh, think through and reflect and, and grieve if, nef if needed. And so there's this component of, of public art that has healing aspects to it. And um, not that this is necessarily public art, but what we see um, in some cases is that this therapeutic effect of art, especially for children, is that if you can draw a sketch and somehow grapple with it, um, it's, a, it's a way that, to help you deal with the feelings that you're, you're experiencing. And so, um, you know, children were, were drawing about uh, the World Trade Center and then those were collected and put into a, a, um, um, a gallery uh, for other people to experience and, and, and take note. Uh, similarly, for other disaster events like Katrina, uh, again, this therapeutic effect of being able to uh, put your feelings into pictures. Uh, you, we have some examples here, and then these ended up being, uh, some things end up being even a published book, The Story of a Storm. Uh, here you see a picture of that. So given those aspects, uh, I just wanted to address a couple of things I thought were uh, necessary or 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 things that a, uh, the functions that a city should play in helping either facilitate or or contribute to these efforts. And 
One of the things I, I thought was interesting as I thought about uh, public um, art is that, and, and Dan mentioned this in his talk as well, is that if you think of scale and you think of the broadest scale, the, in many cases the city is the art form. It is the um, image and the thing that um, is used to, to deliver the artistic message and, and this is just a, a you know a, a futuristic uh, depiction of a city but done in in an art form um, and then some of our buildings uh, and the designs are really looking at the city in its aesthetic overall um, contribution and not just its functional and so you get all kinds of in the, in the future uh, tenses, you get all kinds of interesting kinds of uh, um, depictions. And then um, also just the city as it's in its form that it is, artists like to take images of that and work with it in, in its, in its uh, aesthetic uh, form as, just as, as you find it and make models of it and play with it and, and use the colors from it and all these different kinds of ways that use the city itself as a, as a, as a focal point for uh, art. And then probably uh, taking this to the extreme is, is the city of Dubai where they've, they've taken architecture and design at a city level and this is a aerial view of some of the, the land terraforming they're doing for uh, different developments uh, that, that show I don't have a cursor here, but uh, one is the is a, a map of the of the world. Another is this huge uh, pond frond kind of thing that's the Palm Islands, and um, and and this is in Singapore. The the ship building. All of these things are 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 much bigger in scale. Where we're looking at um, you know cities and um, and structures as being art themselves. So, um, so the last two things I'll, I'll mention are that the, the city does play a very crucial role in being a facilitator for these things. It, both <coughs> as, as we have heard from others that it can be a barrier and an obstruction in many cases, but without cooperation it makes m many of these projects impossible. So there, there really needs to be um, uh, greater partnerships that, that, you know, greater artistic thinking on the city side but also recognition on the artistic side that there are regulations and different things that have to be uh, accommodated so that these things can be enacted. And then the last piece would be the funding piece which um, again the cities in the US today as with lots of public institutions have had budgets cut. Um, so it takes creative partnerships between the local governments and those that wish to see these projects enacted uh, to really make them a go. And that's all I've got. Thank you very much. And our final presenter is Keith Mountain. He's coming through. He's professor and chair of the Department of Geography and Geoscience and was recently appointed state geographer, geographer for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. As a climatologist with a speci specialty in glaciology, which we will explore in global climate change, Dr. Mountain has been part of over 25 international expeditions to study existing glaciers and ice sheets to understand the Earth's climate history. Thank I you can really only imagine this. I'm not going to talk anything about ice. It's cold enough out there as it is. So, uh, let's just bring this up. Got to, well, I, in the constraints of time that we have available, I, I try to make my talk as brief as I can. Uh, I think one of the, the uh, things we want to talk about today, uh, the idea that if you've, uh, the previous presentations, the power of imagery. The, the, John showed pictures of things from the air. Uh, David showed images that you would take many, many words to express, and in reality, one picture solves that, that problem. Unlike Kukumla, who doesn't seem to have any sense of the aesthetic. Uh, um, is this just, yeah, that's, there we go. All right. So what I want to talk about today a little bit is, uh, is, is maps. 
the power of the power of maps, so both as an art form and both as a uh, as a, a common representation of our surface and what we can do with them and where we are with them. I think uh, if I think about maps, I think about those as the, uh, the most ubiquitous of all public art forms. Ever since we've had maps, they represent space. Uh, to represent space in reality represents a synthesis of how, and those are uh, optional choices on artistic talent. They are an optional choice on what that purpose of that map is. They are representations of reality in some form. And the most successful of these things. It's not pretty good. Sorry. Yeah, it's got to keep shutting down. Yeah, well, it's just shutting. It's not good. No, it's shutting down. All right, well, it's. That's not working. It's David's fault here. You got something. Urban and public affairs are always subjected to. Well, it, it brought it up when we uh, looked at it. So, oh shoot, that's not that tails. We don't want to go through that again. <laughs> okay, here you are, right? Yep, that's us. Let's see what we All can right, do see, without. Yeah, it? I would just leave it like that because it's when you process it. Right. Okay, it's not going. So we can't go back to to uh, view yeah, slideshow. Yeah, we can do slideshow. Yeah, slideshow from the beginning. That should do it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, there. All right, there. so I will touch it gently. <laughs> um, so uh, just the idea here is that I want to take a few moments to, to think about maps and think about public space in reality and, and to, to look at it as we do in geographers that tend to look at things spatially. We look at things that changes over time and we look at changes over space. And the best way to think of space is to use a map. It's the common tool that we have used. Maps themselves, of course, uh, are, uh, are in every part of our lives every day, as I'll, I'll demonstrate in a minute. So I have put, uh, put the term geography there as a shameless attempt to promote my discipline, which I'm very good at. Um, Maps uh, have a whole history of maps. If, you, if you're interested in history, you're really interested in, him, in maps. If you're interested in science, you're interested in maps and how. If you're interested in exploration, all of those things that follow an enormous progression of knowledge on how we understand the earth, how we represent it, and, uh, and the elements of creativity that are going to be in with that. And so we look at maps that might be a standard Mercator projection such as this. Hundreds and hundreds of different types of projections out there. Some are whimsical, some are some, or mathematically founded, and this is a standard Mer Mercator projection, full of errors, full of misinformation, the most common of all the maps, and in which case they evolve uh, perceptions of space and place and time's relationships. Uh, sometimes these have been used to very nefarious purposes in, in, in the political uh, environment. And uh, we can use maps such as this that are uh, on the, uh, really trying to demonstrate three-dimensional work. And these are really artistic representations of a very important issue in the world around us. And geographers are very, very good at that. Um, uh, I'll just give you a quick example here. Uh, this is a standard USGS uh, coordinate system, uh, common 1 to, 1, 1 to 25,000 map. Almost every student that has crawled out from underneath a flat rock has seen a map of this particular type. Uh, these are syntheses of reality. The lines are elevations, uh, schematics for the representations of rivers, uh, com uh, community uh, organizations, such like. It's a spatial challenge. And so what what has happened here is that this is one particular representation of that and a most standard. And if we take this exactly the same map and then shade it in, use some sort of uh, relief shading, the shading on these maps are normally the sun coming in from the northeast with a solar elevation of about th between 40 and 45 degrees. That gives the dimensions of a three-dimensional scale and really transmits quite a, a, a momentary different feel for that map. And that's what it looks like 
in reality from the air. So you can see something like that translated to that. And so that's, that's a, 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 a tool that has synthesized the realities of that landscape but kept the integrity of it. Uh, we use maps in, in, we can compound them in a variety of ways. So in a map such as the geology of Kentucky, you now have a perspective, a planimetric view from down on the top. You've had to make choices on colors, color arrangement, uh, sequencing, uh, what, what informations are more predominant than the others. And then we have a cross-sectional view on the side of that. Uh, the diversity of maps of which there is no end. Uh, this one was put together by uh, our folks at the Center for GIS, Bob Forbes, the director of the center, uh, we were challenged to look at the lighting on the University of Louisville. So we knew where to put lights, just in the same way that maybe John was talking about the arrange arrangement of space. Uh, the subsequent map to this looked at light intensity. So which areas were dark? It's an issue of, of community safety. The so mapping this project has done that. Uh, we mapped the uh, flood, the 2009 flood from Louisville, and we're able to bring this in digitally and then change the elevations and work out where the flood, work out where the damage was, and now we have all manner of mi mitigation practices on campus that will avoid this particular type of flooding yet again. Again, it's another power of maps. Choices have to be made in terms of arrangement. Now, the question is that you might ask, is this a map or is it a schematic? Well, this is the map that was actually put together by Bob Forbes and, and uh, uh, colleagues at the Center for GIS that dealt with the transportation network, uh, network required to get thousands and thousands of people through the stadium and the H1N1 flu outbreak. So the question now becomes, is this a schematic or is it public art? Well, in fact, thousands and thousands of people had to use this particular diagram. And so, as in all maps, it has to serve a purpose, it has to be very precise, it has to be readable, and it has to have an appeal so that people want to carry with it. So the question is whether it is a map is art uh, or is it a tool, I would contend that something like a map, if it is not aesthetically put together, pleasingly and usable, uh, it is, an, it is no, a non-functionable tool. So those are the issues you take. Now, if we look, start to look a little more critically at some of our landscapes that we might think about, uh, the aerial perspective, I think, and it's certainly looking at John's, I mean, straight away, John went to an aerial photograph. That's the way we can, uh, we can conceive the organization of space. But space for us as geographers takes, can change over time, maps can change over time. And so it's just a few photographs here of, uh, that, that might give you a, a sense of how I maybe as a geographer look at changes on the landscape. And even if they're not changes, but just how a momentary view from a perspective might impact how that is perceived. And, and I contend that these are equitable forms of art. And I think that the earth itself can be used as a form of public art. It, 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 it is there. So take a look at this little area right down in the foreground here, uh, that small little uh, promontory that pokes out. And if you just come over that a little more, you end up with a di entirely different perspective and feeling for what that particular landscape is. So it is that little promontory right down in, in, the, in, the, in the forefront there. And so it tells you something about not the ge just the geographic arrangement, but for geographers, it also tells us something about process. Uh, this is the lowering of, uh, of Rough River Dam before the snow melted. Uh, the simple being uh, something made quite extraordinary. So here's a, a simple a sludge pond. You probably can't get any more extraordinary. It's a water treatment plant. And notice that little section down in there. Does that cur cursor show up at all on that? So notice that little section down in there, and just by coming over that and, in an aircraft and just looking at quite a different perspective, you're going to end up with something like that. So it, it's really sort of just a perspective view on, on this. Uh, something uh, human use, human occupancy of landscape. Uh, whether or not you consider that art, it certainly generates patterns and processes and relationships that we as geographers think about. And this is a... Uh, a, a um, Oh, what do you call them, a flower place or a, a what, what do you call those? Nursery. Nursery, that's right. There's a term I don't use every day. Uh, <laughs> but if you, if you come over that, then you can see what happens. So I've just 
come over and just photograph the individual elements of this very common thing that gives you it maybe a different artistic sensation. Uh, again, another is a paper pulp mill down in Breckenridge County. Notice the area down here in the forefront, and just by coming over that, you get another entirely different feel for what that environment is composed of. And I would point out that that by itself would not make much more, not make a lot of sense if it was not placed in context. And that's the task that confronts people that make maps or represent the surface of the earth. And uh, we have all manner of environmental impacts. Uh, this is one of, a, uh, of a, an acid mine drainage area. So it, the, there is a lot of implications that could be behind this, but it's really not going to work unless you have a good solid image of it. Something like a natural feature, for example, can have uh, 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 an unusual pattern. This is the Dix River. When they put in the Dix Dam, they flooded out some of the older channels and now you ended up with this rather unusual looking feature on the landscape which is very distinctive on the maps. And maps of course can be extremely whimsical. Uh, you can ask if they're, so we have made the globe here from orange peel and potato chips. <laughs> so I, I contend that maps are art and they do have the role a significant role in people's understanding of their sense of place, uh, what's there, the organization of space, which is most, most critical. And uh, just as a point of interest, I, I think professionally, uh, the whole career of cartography and spatial representation has changed significantly. I've just put, put up one map over here. Not, we no longer sit around and draw maps. They're all done electronically. I think there are good and bad things to that. But we can make maps such as this very, very easily. Anybody can make maps. And I, I contend that part of our challenge now is not in the technology of the production, but to create uh, the mindset of students and users of these uh, electronic services to have a good sense of the aesthetic, not necessarily a good sense of simply producing it. And so you can have a feel free to have a look at those. These were produced over in our department. Our students produce these sorts of things every day. Anyway, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was terrific. Now I realize we're, we haven't got a lot of time, so I will what I was thinking I could do is put one sort of broad question to the four of you and also open to the room so and we can begin here and move it out there and it's basically um, what I would like to think about and everyone to comment on as much as they can in the given time um, is this idea that was repeated in different ways among all of you about or uh, what I heard um, the notion, our ideas about public spaces and how they're used, the ones that are successful, like River Park, Waterfront Park, which are used by the whole range of people in this city, and then how they are created, the mounds. The idea of a public space um, being the work, the process of, of the hands of all. Um, and so when I think about that and the idea of mapping and how we can, we can represent our space, I wonder what, what is the space of this city? Um, what is it? What characterizes it? Is it a ritual? Is it, is it um, a, a, just a voyeuristic pass through along a bike path? What is it to you? What can it be? What are the public spaces? What is their character and how could they be activated or enlivened in new and other ways? Is that, is that a question? <laughs> Would you like, thank you. I will start Yasmin's ball rolling by saying that for me as an archaeologist, when I see a world in which, as a Cahokia, all of the great structures are public structures, all of the design is for the entire community, I feel there is a tremendous sense of dynamism and forward motion. When I see a uh, city like some of the late Roman Empire cities, when all of the major structures are private, villas, uh, places where the great families take their wealth and sit in a palatial style private enterprise, something has gone terribly wrong. So. Uh, I feel that the that balance between the public and the private, as soon as it shifts too far toward everything being put into the public and accessible to the few, you've got trouble.
Uh, I was just going to say that uh, as trained as a planner, um, planning as a field is future based and so someone asked the question what will things look like in the future and that's, that's what we all need to be concerned about. The, the urban planning as an as a academic and, and practitioner discipline is all about what do we want that future to be and so my view is that the more we can do that together and the more that we can find the common values and and uh, elements that we want to see in that future, the more we work together we can achieve that. And I'm, I'm excited about our department is involved with the Vision Louisville project. We're excited to um, help facilitate that visioning for the next 30 years in our community and hopefully everyone's input will be um, included in that. Um, yeah, I should stay away from technology. <laughs> Blackboards, what I like, chalk. Um, I, two things, I think it's very important that we purchase property out in the urban fringe for future generations. If they hadn't bought the parks for the Olmstead parks, we wouldn't have these fabulous parks, which we have. But that's easy. That really is the easy part. The harder part is where we already have uh, urban density. We already we have shortage of space. We have, you know, let's 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 bring. You know, I'm not saying don't buy. You know, Floyd's whatever that is out there. Um, I, if it's past the Waterston Expressway, I think I need a passport to get there. So I'm really a person in the city. But my feeling is that it's the city is where we have the most desperate need and concern. That's where the imagination needs to be. That's where the creativity needs to be. And it's, it's, that's where the city needs to link together with artists, with creative people. And my basic rule of thumb is hunt for something that we really think is a success and then ask, how do we do that? And again, I come back to you know the riverfront. How did that work? And then maybe we should think about that uh, as a as a way to think forward for the city. Let me take a, a, a little different twist on that. How about we think about spaces that we can't see or not allowed to see? There is a wonderful book out by a cartographer by the name of Marc Monnier who wrote this entire tr treatise on that maps as being uh, zones of exclusionary, places where you can go, places where you can't go. A lot of uh, things, for example, uh, cl clear-cut areas, uh, if you drive along a road, it looks like the vegetation's all very dense, but you get in an airplane, fly 400 yards over that, and they have devastated this landscape. So uh, those sorts of flying over uh, coal, coal mining areas areas in eastern Kentucky. You very rarely see the magnitude of that space, which is in fact a uniform, in many ways, a public space that is not allowed to be seen. And maybe we should think about it in that way too. That's a fascinating um, idea. And, and what I've noticed today, and it's interesting, is it's this landscape, which is maybe a intuitively feels very different from other places. Um, I've personally worked in where it's the, the more demographic issues that are trumping. Here it seems that the landscape is emerging again and again. Is there anyone who would like to? Yes, please. Have to Once again, thank you uh, for being so instructive. I appreciate it. Uh, I would like to reflect on the use of public space and in some cases, what we might be concerned about is an aggressive taking of public spaces, this is going to sound terrible, for public art. I think of the mall in Washington, D.C., which is a huge public, or was, green space, that now every single thing that needs a monument is now going on the mall, it seems. Like. And then in reflecting on the Oklahoma City Memorial, I think aesthetically, design-wise, it was a stroke of genius. But as we look to the future, to leave a permanent memorial to grief in the middle of that city where everybody walking through it on their lunch breaks had to be quiet. You know, there wasn't any, you couldn't put your feet in a reflecting pool, that was too disrespectful. And it's there forever. And I, it didn't lead you out of the room, I guess is what I'm saying. So that's not to end this on a negative, I apologize. But uh, those are some thoughts. I have the same feeling you do about some of the recent memorials. I think World War II Memorial in the Mall is uh, 
Uh, it's very sad to see people trying to react with it by putting flowers and memorials in places not meant, unlike Maya Lin's Vietnam War Memorial, where it is the people's interaction that adorns the memorial, that makes it a memorial, uh, and the reflections that you see of yourself looking through the names. Nothing of that in the World War II, and a desperate public trying to find places to allow that to happen. So uh, perhaps you're right about uh, a lot more thought needed to go into some of these. Okay, maybe I think, oh yes? Peter, is that that, or are we? I think we've, uh, we've come to a close. We've had a lot of uh, different perspectives and, and uh, rich full thought. Uh, I think one of the interesting conclusions I have is the, uh, certainly the very many definitions of art and different definitions of public space which we've heard this afternoon, and definitions of park land as art and different definitions of art. Uh, I, come back to uh, Mary Mrs. Broadway project as this interesting way of making what <coughs> is uh, possibly, I mean, it's a city space because it's a street, it's also a commercial space, it's also a private space, but making that a public space and making that a celebration and that notion of uh, major interventions which uh, inflect the environment in, a, in such a graceful and interesting uh, interesting way. So I, everything we do is setting the ground for the future. I think we have a lot of uh, different perspectives and different definitions we have to uh, grasp with, uh, but uh, in this country, as Professor Cumber pointed out, uh, we have particular challenges with regard to our uh, public spaces and public art has an incredible role to activate perception of how those spaces can perhaps uh, function and our society can perhaps function uh, more effectively. And I think. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming, and I want to thank all of our panelists for their wonderful contributions.